Holland will be here to talk about his new book, Designing by the Seat of My Pants. Ron Holland, that is the famous naval architect, will write all about his candid view of building uh, everything from 17-foot dinghies to 217-foot incredible luxury racers and cruisers. And then on May the 2nd, uh, T Steve Tashia will be here. He's the chairman of the selection committee for the America's Cup Hall of Fame. He'll talk all about higher and faster the origins of America's Cup. And then you want to come by on April the 11th because our own Bob McGullough will be here to talk about his newest book all about the capture of the submarine uh, U-505, A Legion of Heroes. Bob's got a great talent for writing these books and we want to hear his latest one. On March the 14th, you want to come by and listen to Professor Philip Eliasoff who will be here to talk all about um, Winslow Homer Pants Paints. Windsor Homer Paints, I pant, Windsor Homer Paints, Manifest Destiny. Uh, he's a professor and authority on Winslow Homer, and he'll show the incredible yachts and fishermen that Winslow Homer used to characterize America in our earlier years. On the March 7th, you can come by and uh, be inspired by Dave Holscher, who swam from here to the Fairlawns, 30 miles and back. Who else has done that? No hands? Um, <laughs> On the 21st of um, February, you want to come by and listen to Kimba Livingston, who will talk all about blowing up the junior program and uh, segmenting it into different aspects of sail training and uh, his plan to basically revolutionize that program in a, in a really fun and productive way. It's got off to a good start. And next week, you want to come by on Valentine's Day, which also happens to be the eighth anniversary of San Francisco's first victory in the America's Cup. You may recall that Ellison had three challenges, the uh, fourth, fifth, and sixth challenge from San Francisco. We, St. Francis Yacht Club, had the first challenge in 87. Anyway, on the sixth challenge, they won, and Tom will be here to give us his own view on the America's Cup, what's new and what's next for the oldest game in sport. Now, a little bit about our speaker today. Uh, born in Germany, uh, his first recollections and first boating experience was on his dad's rowboats. And eight or nine years of age, he remembers uh, uh, hearing all about how incredibly important it is to be uh, a rower. And his father was three feet from making the 1932 Olympic team. He stayed, on, stayed in rowing his whole life, and in 53, on the threat of an attack from the Russians as he saw it, he made plans to take the family sailboat and escape to Ireland, for goodness sakes. Um, Bob came to America in 1960, um, went to school in America, uh, became a professor at UCLA, um, became a U.S. citizen in, in uh, the year 1970, and uh, got his bachelor's degree and then his master's and finally his Ph.D. in Berkeley where he learned to sail, right over there on those, uh, f those flats where we hold the Olympic trials and so on. Uh, he continued to uh, write, wrote several textbooks while he was at UCLA and thereafter, and Ronald Reagan noticed him in 86 and selected him to become a governor on the Federal Reserve Board, a very timely slot for him to have been in to talk about what's in the news today. Um, he became, uh, he advanced in business and became the CEO of Visa USA, not a small uh, post, and in 2016, wrote a really great book called The Unlikely Governor. He's a frequent contributor on CNBC, and he'll hear, be here to talk to us all about the challenges facing, facing the new chair of the Federal Reserve Board. Welcome our authority, Bob Heller. Bob. Yeah, that's the record. Oh, this is. <laughs> Images. Here we go, Bob. Thank you, Ron, for the kind introduction. Really appreciate to be here with all of you. And I'm very delighted to see so many good friends in the audience. I brought my own cheering section from across the bay here. <laughs> Today, I think we've got a very uh, interesting and uh, topical topic. Uh, the new challenges facing the uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve Board. Just think, two days ago, you were appointed chairman of the Federal Reserve Board. And... The market is crashing down, 1,500 points. What are you going to do? Is the world coming to an end? Uh, let's look at the challenges facing uh, Chairman Powell in, 19, in 2018. 
First of all, let's talk about the new team that you actually have to work with here, a new man on the job. Where do we stand as far as the economy is concerned? What are the challenges facing the Federal Reserve in specific, and what does the future really look like? So, first thing to talk about is your team. Just on Sunday, you saw two great football teams battling it out, and they all had 11 guys on the, uh, on the tarmac. And here is your team. You're the chairman. On the side of you is Randy Qualtz, the vice chairman, and I'm very pleased to see his aunt, Sally Griffith, sitting in the audience here. Welcome, Sally. He is the, <laughs> he's the new vice chairman of the Federal Reserve, appointed late last year. And then he has one more member of the Board of Governors, Lael Brainerd, who is left over from the Obama days. Everybody else is gone. So instead of having a team of seven governors, you have three governors. When I was at the Fed in the 1980s, which is a while ago, we wouldn't have been able to meet. We defined the quorum as the majority of the members of the board, that, uh, of the seven. So unless you had four people in the room, the Federal Reserve was unable to act. Because of 9-11, the Federal Reserve changed that voting rule, and they said, okay, it is a majority, a quorum is a majority of all the people who are present and <laughs> voting. <laughs> well, if you take it to the extreme, you know, uh, if Qualtz hadn't made it, if Brainerd had resigned, there would be Powell by himself, and he'd be running the show, right? Well, not a very good way to run an airline. <laughs> but help is on the way. Uh, uh, President Trump has nominated Marvin Goodfriend, a professor at Carnegie Mellon, former uh, economist at the Richmond Fed, to be on the board. And actually tomorrow, the uh, hearings in the Senate will be held for him. So hopefully, there will be four people pretty soon on the Federal Reserve Board. But the broader policy setting committee is the FOMC, the Federal Open Market Committee. And that's constituted of the seven governors, if there are seven, plus five of the presidents of the 12 Federal Reserve Banks. There are 12 presidents, as you know, and five of them on a rotating basis take their turn voting at the FOMC meetings. The president of the New York Fed, uh, Bill Dudley, he is always voting. New York, special town in the country, right? So he always gets to vote, but he's retiring in June, July. There are two new members, brand new to the uh, Federal Reserve System, President Beak and President Bostick from Richmond, from Atlanta. And so they are newbies. And two experienced hands, Loretta Mista and our own John Williams here from San Francisco, they are two old hands. So what do you have on the, federal, on the Federal Open Market Committee? You have four members with at least a year's experience. This in total makes it the least experienced FOMC in U.S. history. So that's the team we are fielding at the present time. Uh, to uh, help the nation uh, remain on an economic even keel. What's the role of the Federal Reserve? Congress has been given the Federal Reserve basically three uh, functions. Number one, to promote, uh, promote maximum employment. Number two, stable prices. And three, to provide for moderate long-term interest rates. That's what's known as the dual mandate. As far as I can count, there are three goals. <laughs> but the dual mandate, okay, we'll make it that. It's Federal Reserve math. You've got to get accustomed to it. You know, three, three is equal to two in their books. If you look at how well the Federal Reserve has done, and we certainly got to give Janet Yellen a lot of credit for that, the Federal Reserve has certainly achieved the two most important goals, maximum employment, 
4.1 percent. Can't get much lower than that. If we're really lucky, we get 3.7, 3.8, or something like that. But that's really it. That's the normal turnover uh, that will always happen. And second, stable prices. About 2 percent, the Federal Reserve has set as its goal. And I remember that Congress really says we want stable prices. Now, if I'd ask you what stable means, in my book it means not much change, i.e. zero. But the Federal Reserve has defined zero to mean two. And <laughs> so if you look at the last minutes of the FOMC meetings, you know, last week, you know, they actually three times they mentioned, well, we hope that inflation will increase and that hopefully we will be soon up to 2% inflation. Well, we'll be talking a lot more about that in the next couple of slides here. Third goal of the Federal Reserve, moderate long-term interest rates. And the Fed certainly has achieved that as well. If you look at the graph, which sort of starts around 1980, and I was at the Fed in the mid-80s, you saw interest rates of 10, 12, 13 percent. All the people who are in the real estate business here in the audience, you, you were shuddering in those days. You couldn't sell a home unless you had an existing mortgage. And can you imagine paying every year 12 percent uh, of the value of the house just to the mortgage company. Now interest rates are a lot lower, roughly 2.8 percent on the 10-year uh, treasury rate, and you can still get a mortgage for around 4 percent, so everything is well there. So I can understand why the Fed isn't taking credit for having achieved that third goal as well. The Fed has done very well. and. We are at the moment really in a sweet spot. Uh, I said the Fed is roughly where it wants to be, uh, and the Fed still want, uh, the Congress has set stable prices, but the Fed wants to get the prices up. If you look at the economy as a whole, interest rates are still clearly too low. At the moment, roughly 2 percent inflation. The Fed funds rate is only 1.5 percent, so basically you are always losing money if you got your money in a bank account or uh, a CD or something like that. You are bound to lose uh, part of your investment. So interest rates should be much higher, especially at this phase in the cycle where the economy is at full employment uh, roughly. What does it mean, the Federal Reserve saying, let's have 2 percent inflation? In 35 years, with 2 percent inflation, the price level will roughly double. In 70 years, and if I look at the audience here, most of you have 70 years experience, or many of you have <laughs> 70 years experience, a dollar will be worth a quarter. Now, that's not stable prices, right? Look at the historical record. Here's a graph which I've stolen from some uh, other people, uh, Mr. Reinhardt and Mr. Rogoff, and it shows the price history of the country since our founding in 776. Actually, the chart starts in 775. You notice for the first 150 years or so, prices were very stable. How come? We were on what is known as the gold standard, and so prices didn't change. The vertical line shows you when the Federal Reserve was founded in 1913, Christmas Eve. And look what has happened since. Prices are going through the roof. So the Federal Reserve has not been exactly a stabilizing uh, factor as far as prices are concerned here. Yeah. For the men in the audience, you know, how much is an ounce of gold worth? We talked about the gold standard. It's always the price of a good men's suit. So uh, roughly you can tell. You know, in the old days it was 35 bucks. You could buy a suit. Uh, and now it is certainly above $1,000. 
I talked about the Federal Reserve having a 2 percent price target, 2 percent inflation uh, target. Uh, I think it's difficult to hit any one target. And as, as long as you're just a little bit below, like we are now, about 1.8, 1.9 percent inflation, the Fed says, oh, we've got to get inflation up. Well, three months from now, when we're at 2.1, will the Fed then say, oh, we've got to get inflation down? It leads to jerky reactions and overreactions of the policymakers. So it may be unstable situation. It would be a lot better, in my view, if you just set a price range. As long as prices rise between zero and two percent, then you are okay and no reason to act. They should be happy and call it a day. What have been the effects of the low interest rate policy of the last decade? Clearly, it led people to reach for yield. If you're not making any money at all in your savings account or in your checking account, well, everybody turns, where can I make some money? And where did people turn? Obviously, the stock market, the other big market that's around. And as a result, we have right now one of the highest P.E. ratios that we've had in our history. And you saw on Monday, Tuesday, and today, pretty wild fluctuations in the stock market as everybody is guessing, well, will it come to an end this week, maybe next month? Well, if next month, then maybe I should take some money off the table right now, but then will I miss the next rally? And as a result, you get increased volatility. People also rush to the real estate sector. They went into alternative investment uh, hedge funds and things of that sort. The rich during the last decade got richer. The poor certainly didn't earn any money on their uh, banking accounts. And so income inequality was actually accentuated, something the Federal Reserve definitely did not want to have as a side effect of the policy that they were pursuing. Uh, financial distortions are all over the place. Savers are earning very little money, as I said, and insurance companies and pension funds, as a result, are grossly underfunded. There are few pension funds in this country, and especially public fu pu pension funds, that are actually fully funded. Most of them are 50%, 60%, 70%, and if they're public commitments, that means that you or your children will be on the hook because sooner or later all these people will be uh, paid their pension as their government is obliged to do, and then uh, somebody has to raise your taxes, uh, and the result will be a lot of unhappiness. I talked already about people shifting to riskier assets, and the real estate market was booming. And all you've got to do is look at San Francisco and Silicon Valley and Marin and all our neighborhoods. We're all sitting there smiling because our real estate taxes haven't gone up. Our prices have gone up for the last decade, and uh, so we have been happy campers. Hasn't been true for the rest of the country. If you're in Stockton, if you're living in Modesto, if you're living somewhere in Iowa, in South Dakota we were talking, you know, uh, there are a lot of good bargains uh, still to be had compared to the real estate prices that we have here. So what does the future look like now that we have passed a new big tax stimulus measure? And mind you, we've been doing that at a moment when the economy is already at full employment. So we are providing additional fiscal stimulus, the personal tax cuts, which will be enjoyed by about 80, 85 percent of all people in the country because the standard deduction has become so much higher. Uh, everybody, not everybody, but 80 percent, 85 percent of the people will be benefiting and get bigger paychecks uh, as we speak. Uh, so that will result in more spending by these people. In addition, the uh, corporate tax cuts, which were, in my view, 
also sorely needed because we were no longer competitive uh, with the rest of the world. Lower corporate taxes, now at 25 percent, will greatly help the U.S. corporations to invest more in futures. Some people will be doing stock buybacks. Some of them will be uh, paying more dividends. Some are giving them higher salaries. But everybody has more money uh, to spend in the market. And as a result, you know, we will have further stimulus in the economy. The Federal Reserve also had been buying a lot of stocks during the last decade. Right at the height of the uh, last recession, the Federal Reserve engaged in quantitative easing, a novel procedure that they didn't use to do. So they bought up a lot of government bonds and mortgage-backed securities uh, from uh, the public. And that's what you see here on the graph, that very first spurt, that first big increase in the size of the Fed's portfolio. And then the Fed said, they said well, uh, now what are we going to do? Let's do it again. And you see the second sharp increase. And not much happened in the economy. We were still growing very, very slowly. Nothing was happening. They said, well, let's try it again. And again, they put the foot on the gas pedal and bought a couple of trillion dollars. So right now, the Federal Reserve owns about the equivalent of 22 percent, almost a quarter of the entire U.S. government debt has been financed by the Federal Reserve. Now, last November, the Fed said, OK, let's start to reduce the portfolio. After all, we are at full employment. We have stable prices. So let's get rid of all these assets which are sitting on our balance sheet. Let's try to normalize procedures. And so they decided to do it very cautiously, which is good. And instead of selling the portfolio, they just, you know, when, it, when the bonds uh, run off, they don't uh, renew them. They just let it run off. And it's slowly increasing at the present time from about 50 billion a month to about from fi uh, 10 billion a month to about 50 billion a month. By mid-year, we will be roughly there. Now, 50 billion a month, that's not chump change. <laughs> Times 12, that's 600 billion a year that you are pulling out of the market. The Federal Reserve is no longer financing it. The government debt is still there. Somebody got to buy it. And who is that? You guys, right? All of you in the audience. The private sector has to absorb that, and that will result in higher interest rates uh, for everyone. So what's the challenge facing the chairman? We are still having an accommodative monetary policy, and at the same time we have an, a more easy, more expansionary fiscal policy. And those two forces are colliding here on that poor little fishing boat in the middle. And the question will be, you know, will they jump forward like a, like a pea, if you squeeze a pea and it shoots forward, or will it bring the economy and the little fishing boat in the graph, in the, uh, in the slide here, will it come to a stop? The ace in the hole, the one factor that we haven't looked at is regulatory policy. And here the president had a very clear message to, uh, to his administration. For every single new regulation you put in place, you've got to eliminate two other regulations. And they've done that. Last year, there were 60 seven regulations that were wiped out, and only three new regulations were put on the books. So the regulatory climate is definitely easing. Where do we see it? In the banking system, especially the smaller banks see more streamlined regulation. The FDA will do faster drug approval. There's now a push, uh, push on the foot uh, that uh, people who have a terminal illness are allowed to use experimental drugs. 
and what's wrong with that? If the doctor tells you, hey, you're going to be dead three, four months from now, I'm going to try that pill that may wipe out my cancer or whatever I have, right? Never mind that there's a risk factor. I'm going to die anyhow. So may as well try the new drugs. Uh, there are a lot more approvals for proposals for offshore drilling. We all hope that they won't do it to find the next oil well right in front of the Yacht Club. Well, maybe, you are, maybe you'd love the revenues from it too, right? Anyhow, we don't own it, right? <laughs> City of San Francisco gets it, right. Uh, so uh, drilling will uh, increase, and we just heard also that the U.S. is now having a new record as far as exports of oil, uh, of oil to other countries are concerned. Coal permits are easier to get. EPA reviews get streamlined, and if we only could get our housing approvals a little bit faster, then uh, I think the economy really would be benefiting from uh, the, you know, less regulations, less paperwork uh, in the country as a whole. Here's sort of a little bit more general thought in reference to one of my former professors at Berkeley, Hyman Minsky. Maybe some of you. Uh, knew him or studied with him. Hyman Minsky said, every expansion creates the seeds of its own destruction. And with that he meant that every expansion, there's something happening in there, the stability, the confidence levels that we see. We're all investing in real estate, you know, and then suddenly, like we did in 2008, suddenly it goes wrong with the real estate market and too much investment in real estate by people who couldn't quite afford it, and the thing crashes. The same thing happened with the dot-com boom, if you think back to the year uh, 2000. So uh, stability in itself, he argued, is destabilizing, and you know because people start to act. You know when I knew the stock market was going to fall on Monday? It was last week, Friday, because the the Wall Street Journal had a headline, taxi drivers and uh, retail investors are rushing into the stock market. <laughs> you know, that's the moment you really want to fasten your seatbelt, right? Okay, let's come to the end. What are the two big challenges, the two big elephants in the room? First of all, look at the pension funds and insurance companies. There you really have something, some problem that is waiting to uh, uh, to explode uh, because they haven't earned enough money to pay what they have promised uh, their investors and the, and, and, and the pensioners. And second, the federal debt itself. Uh, we are now roughly at $20 trillion, so that is about equal to the entire GDP of the country. I told you earlier, the Federal Reserve owns about four trillion of that, so that's part of the government. So the private sector roughly owns 75, 80 percent of the total federal debt. Yeah, maybe that's still okay, maybe that's still bearable, but once you get to about 110, 120 percent, you will be in trouble. Just talk to the Greeks. And they know it. They got in a big trouble. They were at 120 percent. And as we get a little bit higher than we are now, it will get troublesome. Furthermore, the government will have to pay a lot more interest on the debt because rates are going to go up, like we argued earlier. And so as they have to pay higher interest rates on the existing federal debt, uh, that puts an additional squeeze uh, on uh, the overall federal fiscal uh, situation. So those two things are something that really watch out for in the year to come. Let's add it all up. Our deficit clearly remains very sizable at 2%, 2.5% of GDP, and it shouldn't be that big at this stage in the cycle. We should be roughly at even we should be, you know, and start to accumulate little surpluses, uh, put away a little bit of uh, funds, a little uh, couple of seed coins 
for the rainy day which will come one of these days. Monetary policy clearly has a long way to go to be normalized. Interest rates, short-term rates, got to roughly double from what they are now. So there will be less monetary stimulus. But regulatory policy, deregulation is all for the good. It will increase productivity, make room, and further stimulate growth. So those are the three big forces that you see at work in the economy right now. So for the coming year, I'd look at at least 3% inflation, 3% uh, growth, 3% growth for the economy. And in the first quarter, the one we're in right now, will probably be better than that, uh, maybe around 4% or something like that. So at the moment, we are, the economy is really cooking. Inflation, roughly 2%, will creep up about above 2% towards the end of the year. Higher interest rates on the long-term end, the U.S. Treasuries, I would expect them to go from about 2.75% today to above 3% as well. Watch for the insurance and pension funds. Real estate will probably still be very good, especially in San Francisco. So overall, smooth sailing <laughs> with just a few squalls ahead, and for a free iced tea. Uh, <laughs> what's the name of the boat you see here? Yeah, <laughs> here's the winner. <laughs> Thank you very much. Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from the St. Francis Yacht Club. Our guest today is the economist Dr. Robert Heller, former chairman of the Federal Reserve Board. Not quite. F former governor. Uh, governor of the Federal <laughs> Reserve Board. I tried to give him a promotion. You see how modest our speaker is today. <clears throat> Bob, if you were chair of the Fed today, what three actions might you take? Well, I would continue to raise interest rates at a pretty good clip. Uh, I would go, you know, normalize policy as fast as possible, and certainly four increases in the Fed funds rate for this year. At the moment, you are at 1.25 to 1 percent in the Fed funds rate. Uh, so by next year, this time, you would be at two and a half percent, roughly, and then you'd have two steps to go. So that's one thing, increase the Fed funds rate and try to get it back to normal as soon as you can. Second, continue to uh, reduce the federal debt that the uh, Federal Reserve is holding. Get the balance sheet back to normal because uh, having this bloated balance sheet has with it an enormous inflationary potential because uh, banks have... Uh, too much in uh, free reserves, unused reserves. And you asked for three. Uh, the third one I would do is I would stop paying banks on their reserve balances that they hold at the Federal Reserve. Those are required reserves. No reason to incent them to hold more balances at the Federal Reserve. Let them lend to the private sector. That's what they should be doing rather than uh, I see the bankers in the audience are all nodding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to have the bankers nodding. Um, having heard what you might do, give us a report card on Janet Yellen. What'd she get on a kind of report card basis? At why? Well, Janet Yellen, as I showed you in the talk, did a superb job in achieving the goals that the Federal Reserve, that the Federal Reserve set out for itself. She couldn't have done better. She couldn't have done better than to get uh, unemployment down to 4%, basically. She has achieved her 2% target uh, for uh, the inflation rate. Now, where I would really differ with her is with her goals in the first place. I would argue we should have 0 to 2% inflation goal. So less inflation is better. It totally irks me. When the Federal Reserve, like in the FOMC statement, which, uh, which I mentioned uh, just last week, three times they mentioned that they hope that inflation will increase. Well, that is 
unacceptable in my view. So she set out the wrong goals for the Federal Reserve, but you know, that's one person thinking that way, there's one other person thinking that way. Greenspan, for instance, when he was chairman, he, uh, he always argued that the inflation rate should be so low that it would not be a factor in the decision making of economic agents, of businesses and individuals. So if the inflation rate is close to zero, then it's not a factor. Clearly what happens when you have 4%, 5% inflation, people say, oh, let's buy that refrigerator now, let's buy the car now because next year it will be more expensive. Uh, that's distorting economic decisions. But 2%, I say, have less inflation than 2%. Why doesn't she want to have two, uh, why doesn't she want to have zero inflation? Because she's afraid that there will be deflation. And deflation, people argue, would be terrible. Now, would it really be terrible? If I ask you which one is the strongest sector in the U.S. economy right now, which would be? Tech. Tech. Right answer. <laughs> and he didn't even know he was asking for that. <laughs> and what's happening in high tech sector? You know, you get a computer for a thousand dollars and then next year you get the same thing for 800 and then you can get it at Amazon for 600 and prices are coming down. Does that really mean the tech sector is doing badly? No, the tech sector is booming. More efficient. So, more efficient, higher productivity, which is a factor that I've been really stressing very much. And so we should not be afraid of some prices to decline and decrease. And you don't need that extra cushion of inflation, which will, like I said, double price level every 35 years. And that is, uh, in my view, <coughs> unacceptable. Um, so if you have a question, hold your hand up, and John will bring you a microphone. I'll keep asking questions until I see we're queued up for one, a question. John, uh, Bob, let me ask you one other question. Uh, biggest worries you might have? Give me top three worries you could have about future Fed actions. Well, three worries. That'll take a while. Uh, <laughs> about, oh, I'm sorry. About, the Fed, about, about future, future Fed, Fed, Fed actions. actions. Yeah. Uh, a, that they don't do anything. That they say, oh, uh, you know, why should we, uh, why should we, things have been so good with low interest rates. Uh, let's just sit tight uh, and not uh, act. The second action would be tightening too fast if they really increase rates now by 200 basis points next week, you're certainly going to see a crash in the markets. So the Federal Reserve has to tread a very tight rope. It has to be steady. It wants to be predictable. Uh, I don't think it really has to be totally predictable. In the old days, you know, we didn't want to be predictable. And uh, uh, so I think those will be, you know, Steady as she goes uh, is the most important thing. Great question in the audience. Hi, uh, two things come to mind. One, you said uh, GDP gets to, uh, our debt to GDP gets over 110, 120%. Japan's at 200. So could you comment on that? And the second thing is, is the concept of negative interest rates in Europe? Uh, yes, good questions. Thank you. The, uh, the Japanese uh, have, th the Japanese have had a lost decade. Their economy isn't growing very fast, so they are not a country that we really should be trying to emulate uh, in that respect. So I'd say uh, not. Second, uh, what was the second question? Get the negative interest rates in Europe. Uh, also, a big mistake. If you are a Dane these days, and you go to your bank and you say, hey, I would like a um, million dollar mortgage. You know what the banker will tell you? He'll say, oh, that means you have to be willing to accept 10,000 euros from me every year. I'm going to pay you. And my answer would be, oh, why don't you lend me two uh, million euros and then you <laughs> pay me 20,000 euros every year. It's an insane world. It's an insane world, and the faster we get away from that insane world where you as a borrower get paid, uh, that doesn't make any sense at all. It's not the way you can run an economy in the medium term 
in the long term on a sustainable basis. Uh, and that is exactly what Minsky is talking about. Uh, you know, this kind of a situation will be of the seeds of its own destruction. Thank God uh, the Europeans are getting out of uh, that particular mode at the present time. Hi. Yes, sir. I tend to be a little biased because Janet Yellen was my professor in business school, but I'd be <laughs> curious to hear your opinions on the new Fed chair and the job you think he may do. Well, uh, I like Janet too. You know, I've had many pleasant lunches with her here in San Francisco, and I'm missing her actually. I don't like that she is uh, not coming back. Uh, I would love to have her around as a, as, an, in, uh, as a neighbor and in the neighborhood again. Lovely lady, very great. And I said, remember, I said she had the wrong goal. She is very, very, she has been very good at achieving uh, the goals that she set out. Uh, the new chairman, uh, Powell, I've met him, but I don't know him uh, well. I don't know him. I can't tell you any uh, secret stories about him. Uh, he's a nice, very well-balanced guy. He has been the, the get-along, go-along member of the Federal Reserve Board. He has never dissented, ever, in his time on the Federal Reserve Board. He has good experience in the investment banking sector. He was a treasury official. So he knows how markets work. He knows how, uh, he knows how uh, uh, the government works. And I think he'll be a very ha steady hand on the tiller. Uh, there were several other contenders who were also excellent people. The president chose him over these other people. And, uh, you know, I got no quarrel with that. He is a... He's a good man. President Reagan ap appointed you to, uh, as a governor of the Federal Reserve Board, talk for a little bit about uh, one of his most famous uh, economic theories. Talk to us about the argument in favor of trickle-down economics. Well, trickle-down economics, uh, you know, it's been used as a, you know, as a derogatory term, but all economics is trickle-down economics. You make a great invention, Steve Jobs, Builds an Apple computer. I was just talking with my neighbor with him. Richard. And, and, and he gave Richard a job. He said, build my house. Was that trickle down? Richard provided a useful service for him. And Steve Jobs employed not only him, but a lot of other people in having that house built. And Richard is a happy man, as far as I can tell, having been part of that trickle down economic uh, uh, economy. So it works. Every eco if you want to be sitting on an island by yourself, uh, what are you going to do? You play Robinson Crusoe and uh, you're sitting there eating coconuts all day long. The, the strength of <laughs> the... Is there something wrong with coconuts? The <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> coconuts for breakfast, coconuts for lunch, <laughs> coconuts for dinner. And pretty soon, you know, <laughs> I've had enough coconuts. <laughs> nothing wrong with coconuts. You've got nothing else to eat. I'd rather have lunch here. <laughs> so uh, I think trickle down is, you know, it's something that, that happens. Uh, and and it, it's a way, who, was, who used the word? Spread the wealth. A pre recent present of ours. What does that mean? It's same thing. So some have talked about a spring up or bubble up economics where they argued giving money to people who are in the middle class would be a more productive economic stimulus. Talk a little bit about uh, what's right or wrong with that premise. Nothing wrong with it. And I think the tax cut tried to be sort of on both sides. Uh, the tax cut gave bigger deductions to just about 80, 85% of the people. So they have directly more money in their own pockets. The people that, I, uh, uh, that are still sort of shaking their heads, did I gain from the tax cuts or not, are people like me, people like I'm sure a lot of people in the audience here, where, they, where you don't know whether your tax rates have gone up or down. You know, California, a lot of groaning and moaning because the real estate tax and the state tax deductions are no longer there in full force. Uh, well, when I was doing my taxes and then I suddenly pushed that button that says AMT, suddenly 
all these deductions that we just talked about, they disappeared already. So I never benefited from those deductions. So frankly, I really don't know whether I'll be ahead or behind in the game. But then again, you know, uh, you wouldn't count, you would count me probably among the, the luckier people who are at the uh, more at the top end of the income distribution. Uh, so the middle class definitely has gotten it. Should they have done just print up money and send everybody a check? There was one guy who ran for president, right, a few years ago. McGovern was his name. That was his big proposal. Everybody gets a thousand bucks, you know. Uh, there's some politicians who are still advocating that. Uh, I don't think that's the way to run an airline. Uh, but uh, people differ on that. If you just joined us, welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon live from St. Francis Yacht Club. Our speaker today is the economist Dr. Robert Heller, former governor on the Federal Reserve Board. We have another question from the audience. Yeah. Uh, so the Federal Reserve was established to, you know, prevent bank runs and stabilize the market and all sorts of things. Um, but I'm wondering, do you think that there are free market solutions that would perhaps even be better than establishing a Federal Reserve? Excellent question. Should we abolish the Federal Reserve, uh, to put it less <laughs> politely, right? <laughs> Can can Bitcoin take over the world, uh, to put it another way? Well, if you've been watching the fortunes of Bitcoin, you know, uh, half a year ago there was at 20,000, and all of us in this room were sitting there, gee, we should have bought a few Bitcoins. Now it's at 8,000. It goes up and down. It's like a yo-yo. It's more unstable than anything uh, else, that, uh, more unstable than the stock market even. So. Uh, it's very difficult to have a private standard. Unless you say, hey, I want to get back to the gold standard or something like that. And I showed you that one graph which showed that the gold standard essentially gave us a century and a half of price stability. It didn't mean there was economic stability. There were recessions and booms and busts and panics and what have you. All that was happening while overall prices were fairly stable. So do you rather have a government agency that uh, runs the monetary policy of a country that can step in when, uh, that can step in when uh, things get out of line? And like, for instance, October uh, 16th, I think it was in 1987, uh, Greenspan was a pretty new guy on the board. And uh, we were sitting there had a, having a board meeting on Monday. Greenspan wasn't there. He was on a plane flying to, uh, to Dallas to speak at the American Bankers Association conference, if I remember correctly. And the market is rattling down by over 20% on that one day. Uh, so was it good that there was a Federal Reserve? We issued a statement. He said, OK, we will provide liquidity to the markets and we are standing ready to do that in force. That was a very rational, a good response, and it calmed markets down, and you know, the, they settled down, and the, 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 the big uh, thing is now just a little blip on the screen, and it didn't really disturb the economy. It is good to have uh, a Federal Reserve agency that can react in a flexible way to market developments. But they've got to be responsible. Another question from the audience. Uh -huh. Yes, thinking ahead a decade or so, or maybe even less, it seems likely that the next wave of automation is really going to decimate the, the relatively low-skilled labor market. Uh, given that as a kind of hypothetical context, does it still make sense for one of the primary goals of the, of the board to be full employment? I think it makes eminent sense uh, to be at full employment. Uh, I think the ultimate goal of the Federal Reserve, however, is price stability. Provide that environment that we have a monetary standard, a stable store of value, and that is really most important for us. Now, uh, can we, uh, what, what, what will happen as automation proceeds? 
I'm not af afraid of automation in the least. That fear has been with us for one and a half centuries. Uh, you remember in Scotland and in England, the, uh, the workers, they were protesting against the loom weavers, you know, and the automatic loom was first. They tore down the factories and so on. I just spent uh, last month, a good part of the month, we were in Burma. And in Burma, there are a lot of people who are doing weaving, beautiful weaving, wonderful silk embroidery and things like that. They are employed and they're making a living, even in a world where everybody else is doing mechanical stuff. If you, you know, if you want to make, well, if you want to make a uh, overall generalization, I know every generalization is wrong. The British model is kind of fight innovation. The German model is, no, let me work on that brand new machine. I want to be the guy who runs that machine. And if you go and visit Mercedes or BMW or whatever factory you want to go into in Europe, uh, they stand there, they are guys who, and women who make good money running these machines, and the machines are doing the work of 10, 20 people automatically uh, welding the cars together and so on. It makes them more productive and it spreads the, you know, people make good money running those machines. And people make excellent money set, writing up the algorithms for the machine, writing the software for the machines, inventing it. Who are the rich people in this world right now? The ones that do exactly that. Nothing wrong with it, and especially here. We see it every day, Silicon Valley in San Francisco. That is the bread and butter of the backbone of our economy right now. So I, I'm not afraid of automation and artificial intelligence, and uh, you still need people to, to, to run the show. Next question. Uh, yes, sir, John. You know, you're, you're correct. There's no reason to fear innovation, automation, inflation for that matter, even prices. But you know what scares the hell out of me? It's the idea that a bunch of guys in D.C. who are to some degree attorneys of some character <laughs> serve in our Congress and conduct fiscal policy. And to me there's an inherent conflict between their particular aims and those of the Federal Reserve. How can the Federal Reserve be a better balance factor to fiscal profligacy? Well, the Federal Reserve, you can argue, financed a lot of the fiscal uh, profligacy, as you called it, uh, by printing so much money, by buying up the government debt, and by that the Federal Reserve became the handmaiden of Congress. Uh, now, who sends all these folks to Congress? <laughs> it's us, right? We are voting all the time, and we send the people there. Uh, and a uh, few of them get thrown out. Uh, so, you know, the model in Congress is still, I can provide more goodies to you and than the other guy who's running against me, and that is our own downfall. We ourselves are the problem. We elect those people. And what are you waving, John? Yes or no? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it's more responsible voters that you really need. And uh, you can't, you know, I, I agree with you. You don't have necessarily the best people running for uh, Congress. But uh, it's up to us to set that straight. How have U.S. presidents affected favorably and unfavorably the Fed? <coughs> How have U.S. presidents affected the Fed favorably and, and, and or hurt the Fed? I think overall the presidents have done an excellent job in making Fed appointments. All of them. They have been no really irresponsible people in the Federal Reserve Board that I know of. Uh, I've never seen him. The Federal Reserve is also a very strong institution. When you get to Washington, you sort of get enveloped by the institution itself, and you become part of the Fed family. Now you can say that is good, that is bad. 
uh, because you no longer have that sort of independent spirit that you maybe came in with. But it's an excellent staff that the Federal Reserve has. Now, if you really ask me, I'd say the staff is too big. They have the largest congregation of economists in the country. 300 economists are working for the Federal Reserve, plus untold numbers of lawyers and regulators and people who you know, do all the supplemental work, make the computers run and all that stuff. 300 economists. Can you do the job with 100? I'd say yes. But there's somebody on the Federal Reserve Board who knows the answer to everything. So I remember one, one meeting, for instance, just an example, uh, Greenspan, you know, who was a great guy. He loved detail. He loved detail. And FOMC meeting or a board meeting, you know, they're sitting maybe 50 economists are in, actually in the boardroom together with the, uh, with the Board of Governors. So Greenspan asked some obscure question, what is happening? There were two things that you always loved hearing about, uh, paper board production and freight car loadings. Why did you like that? Well, everything got to be put in a box before it is shipped to market, right? So that was a good early leading indicator. And freight car loadings, you got to put it on a train to get it to some place. So he says, well, what's happening with freight car loadings? And silence in the room. And suddenly there's a guy in the third row, he stands up, Mr. Chairman, freight car loadings in the upper Midwest are up 12% uh, year over year. Okay, somebody will know the answer to anything you want to know. <laughs> that is the strength of the Federal Reserve, and you don't get away with just blunderbuss stuff. Yes, sir. Oh. Next question. Robert, um, do you feel that the uh, sanctions that the Reserve Board um, placed on the Wells Fargo Bank on Monday were necessary, or do you think it was an overreaction? Uh, good question. The interesting thing is, that was the very last thing Janet Yellen did on Friday afternoon before she left. Uh, told Wells Fargo, you cannot grow anymore, and four, we need four new board members. Uh, frankly, I think the Federal Reserve has been too easy on some of the bankers and some of the people in the banking industry. In 2007, 2008, when there were really bad things happening in a lot of the banking institutions, very few people got fired. Nobody went to jail. Should somebody have gone to jail for some of the things they did? I think so. And so the Fed has been too easy on it. I myself, I was the chairman of bank supervision regulation in those years. On my watch, 2,000 banks failed. 2,000 banks, the most banks in US history. If you look at the list, here was Bob. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, disasters have been accompanying my whole life. There was always, from, from disaster to disaster, it was, was my life. But uh, uh, some people should have been called more to task. A lot of the people at Wells Fargo, oh, they retired early and stuff like that and had only 300 million in their pocket. That's not right. Other people, 5,000 people got fired. What happened to them in the scandal? So I think what Wells Fargo was doing at that time, that the board wasn't noticing it and that the regulators didn't notice it. So we have all these regulators, the Federal Reserve, the controller of the currency, the FDIC, they're all in these banks all the time, looking over everybody's shoulders. That disaster could go on for five years without the regulators raising a flag. Amazing, amazing. It got finally blown up by a uh, LA Times reporter or something like that, you know, because he got hold of some of the people who got fired and they told him what was going on. But that is, a, I think, it's a failure of the board, and some of the people will get kicked out now. Uh, and then it's a failure of the regulators as well, we have to say. Another question from the audience. Bob, um, I'm curious what your opinion is 
uh, recently, Secretary, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin said a weak dollar was good for the U.S. And of course, it's the world's reserve currency. So I'd be curious to know what your opinion is for a weak dollar versus a strong dollar. Uh, excellent question. And Mr. Mnuchin, uh, Secretary Mnuchin, uh, the next day I think he recanted that uh, statement. Uh, <laughs> you know, he made it when he was in Davos alone. Once the president arrived, uh, you know, okay, well, maybe uh, it was taken out of context. Uh, I would never talk down the dollar. I'm in favor of a stable dollar, just like I'm in favor of stable prices. And if we have stable prices in the United States, I think we have a stable dollar in the world. If other countries uh, overinflate, if they have more inflation, their currency will go down. And if, other, if some countries you know, would have deflation, maybe their currencies go up. But overall, the important thing is that the purchasing power of the dollar in the United States is stable. And as a result, you will also have stability uh, over, uh, overall in the world in the exchange rates. Two days ago, the New York Post wrote an article crediting you with um, the invention of the plunge protection team, <laughs> which kept the market from diving too far through the floor. Could you tell people what that was and uh, what an influence or effect it can have? Yeah, I had a side job as a plumber. Uh, <laughs> plunge protection team. Plunge protection team. What's the plunge protection team? Well, back when I was on the Federal Reserve Board, uh, something irked me. The Federal Reserve would often tell banks and institutions who, they were, who the Federal Reserve was supervising to lend more money to other people. Examples. Uh, you remember the LDC debt crisis in the 70s and early 80s, you know, and the Federal Reserve said, okay, lend more to these countries and then, you know, we'll, they'll be able to work it out, blah, 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 blah. The Federal Reserve, when uh, the Federal Reserve leaned on the banks to make liquidity available to the investment banks when in the 1980s there was a lot of turbulence. So, if you're leaning on somebody who you supervise and tell them to do certain things, and if something goes wrong, I think you are part of the guilty uh, part. I didn't like that. I think the Federal Reserve should not tell that. Let them make the decisions. Let them decide what is the right thing to do. So, but what's the way out then? Remember, in those days, investment banking and commercial banking were still separate. The Glass-Steagall Act was in effect. And so uh, the Federal Reserve, I, th I thought, if they want to help the investment banks and if they want to stabilize the markets, the stock market or the bond market, then the Federal Reserve should do it on its own. The Federal Reserve should step into these markets and while in a way I was caught in a bind because I don't want the Federal Reserve to own stocks, and I don't want them to own bonds. So I said, hey, but how about buying futures or something like that? So you never own the, the stock market, but you buy some futures in the S&P 500 on a day when it's really rattling down. Stabilize the market, turn the market into a two-way market, buyers and sellers on both sides. That's the way the Federal Reserve could help. So that was the plunge. And there was a rumor, and I never know whether it's true or not, there was a rumor that there was a plunge protection team in the Treasury uh, who would say, okay, let's do something about the markets, let's intervene in the markets. And so this guy, uh, you know, I, I gave a speech on the topic, and I wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal on the topic. Uh, that's all well known. And then... Uh, this guy, John Crudeli, I think is his name, he called it after that, after my article, he called the plunge protection team advocated by Bob Heller. And uh, that guy has a good memory. <laughs> 29 years later, when the market on Monday went down, he says, oh, 
Must have been the plunge protection team. Bob Heller rescued the markets. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take a bow. <laughs> Another question from the audience. Bob, thanks for your time today. Um, my question deals with uh, an earlier question as well about uh, fiscal policy. Uh, the aftermath of the financial crisis saw probably unprecedented coordination between Fed and Treasury. Um, in this new administration, they don't really have as much experience, experience working with the two other branches of government. Are you at all concerned about the fiscal policies of repatriating cash, sort of having unintended um, you know, sort of money supply effects that the Fed is not really prepared for? And you know, we saw the tick up inflation, tick up in interest rates this week sort of cause the, you know, the, the blip in the stock market. Um, should we be worried about those types of effects? Well, uh, the focus, I guess, is on bringing in the money uh, back from abroad that have been accumulated uh, corporate profits in uh, other countries. And, you know, I never liked that particularly. There was an aspect of our tax code that encouraged companies to leave money, uh, profits that they'd earned, leave them sitting in Ireland or in the Bahamas or Bermuda or some other place. You know, why not have the money in this country so it can be productively employed by the companies or you're paying, hiring more people or whatever. Bringing back the money, I think, is very, very good. And uh, so far as I can see, there's been no problem with it. Uh, the more, the better, you know, instead of having the money abroad, bring it back here. Uh, but uh, uh, whether the Federal Reserve will be able to deal with any and all problems that may arise out of that? I sure hope so, but nobody knows. Uh, One question. The, uh, the audience would like to know if you would favor the restoration of Glass-Steagall. Glass uh, restoration of Glass-Steagall, absolutely not. Uh, I'll make a confession here, you may not know this. Uh, I was the guy who kicked the first big hole into the Glass-Steagall Act. And why I'm willing to say that so bluntly. When I was on the Federal Reserve Board, the Glass-Steagall Act was in operation, separating investment banking and commercial banking. Uh, as you hear from my accent, I grew up in, and as Ron told you, I grew up in Germany. In Europe, there is no such thing. They're all universal banks. And the Swiss banks and the German banks and the British banks, they're all universal banks, no separation of Glass-Steagall. I never saw much rationale for that as far as the safety of the banking system is concerned. If one part of the bank is doing well, maybe the other part is not doing well. You have a more diversified portfolio of banks. So I'm on the Federal Reserve Board. Before the Federal Reserve Board is the question, whether banks can own a small part of their portfolio, and at that time it was 10%, I think, uh, in uh, securities uh, that they would, that would be prohibited under the Glass-Steagall Act, but that would be incidental to their business. And I thought nothing wrong. In those days, you know, we, have more, we had actually a quorum, right? <laughs> and the motion passes. So uh, our general counsel comes running to me after me and says, Bob, you did it. He says, the Federal Reserve Board has considered this question 12 times, and you finally started to tear down the Glass-Steagall Act by your vote. I said, not so fast. I said, there were four of us. Volcker and Wayne Angel had voted against it. The rest of us had voted for it. And I said, I was just one of four. He says, no, no, no. If you have, had voted no, then the vote would have been three to three, and three <laughs> to three doesn't carry. It's your fault. <laughs> <laughs> so very proudly, I am the <laughs> person who started to tear it down. Then about two years later or so, Congress actually abolished uh, Glass-Steagall. And uh, I guarantee you, we would not have made it as easily difficult as it was through the 07, 08 disaster. There's not a single investment bank that survived the disaster unscathed. 
unless they were bought by a commercial bank, think of Bear Stearns being bought by J.P. Morgan, or they took out a banking charter so they had access to the Federal Reserve, think of Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley. They took out banking charters. They are now subject to the supervision. We have, you know, and if that hadn't happened, the disaster would have been bigger. Bob, thank you very much for being with us today. We've been speaking with a former governor on the Federal Reserve Board, the economist Dr. Robert Heller. Thank you for attending the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon live from the St. Francis Yacht Club. Luncheon is adjourned.